The Rope at the Dock Written and read by Lexi Wolf. I hope you're not afraid of ghosts at all, my companion said with something of a chuckle behind his voice. It was in fact the first thing he had said for the better part of an hour since we'd started our journey, and the bluntness of what he said rather shocked me. I'd not been thinking of anything even approaching something as outlandish and outre as ghosts, and so with a squint but accompanying friendly smile I replied, "'No, not at all. I don't believe in them.' "'Ah,' he said knowingly, but perhaps a tad rehearsed. "'Good show.' To my amazement, he then sat back in his seat as if, with this short exchange, the matter was concluded. I watched him for several moments until he realised and returned my gaze. "'Ghosts?' I reiterated. "'What made you ask me if I were afraid of ghosts?' "'Oh, nothing, nothing!' said the older man, waving it away as if it had merely been a passing thought. Yet the fact that he had been so quiet, and then, to ask me as he had done. I was not convinced at all, but I let the matter lie for some little time as the carriage trundled on. "'Not afraid of anything, I shouldn't wonder. Sure of yourself, young lady, such as yourself,' he added presently. "'Fearing a thing that one does not see or understand is not fear, but folly.' I responded, quoting vaguely, from where I knew not. The fear of ghosts is actually a fear of other things, of things that we do not understand, or the unknown, or perhaps, you might argue, the afterlife, and whether one believes in that or not. My companion did not seem to have thought, prior to my stating this, that his anonymous travelling companion may, in fact, be a student of philosophy, or the human mind. He seemed quite amused at what I said. "'So you think there's no such things as ghosts at all, then, I'll wager?' he continued, with a touch of fondness, and yet, one might almost say, patronization in how he phrased himself, and how he narrowed his gaze as he smiled at me. I smiled back, trying to keep as cordial as I was able. "'I've never seen one,' I returned. "'I've never heard the account of one that I could trust. No one I have ever met has seen or experienced one.' and the only time I hear any good ghost stories is when a professional writer pens them and I get to read those. He nodded slowly. You know of the superstition, though, that those who do not believe are the most likely to see one, so that those in the afterlife might make a believer of them. I had heard some similar nonsense before, but of course never put any stock in that whatever. It seemed to me like a backward philosophy, so often found in those who were not quite so experienced in life or as widely read as others. Not wishing to appear a snob, I gritted my teeth and shook my head, bracing myself for something of a story coming, though I hadn't wished for one. "'You have seen a ghost, then?' I proposed on cue. The old man was possibly not quite as old as I had first taken him to be. He was completely bald, and his face was lined, but there was something of a twinkle in his eye— and he could not have actually been older than fifty-five. He was well dressed, in an immaculate black suit, and had a cane with him, a beautiful ebony black creation that my fiancé Lucas would have envied had he seen it. "'There's no point in telling it you,' he said mystically. "'If you're not a believer, I suppose.' "'Oh, no, do go on,' I urged before I could stop myself, then relinquished. "'I enjoy a good ghost story as much as the next girl, regardless of whether I think it is true or not.' At this he almost appeared to take offence. "'Don't you trust the words of well-meaning strangers?' he asked. Ashamed to say I may have shrugged my shoulders. "'You hear many things from many places. We're supposed to be able to trust the word of those who run the country and the Houses of Parliament, but I wouldn't stake my life on the word of any of those men, no matter how enticing they made it sound.' The slight forgotten he smiled and almost laughed at what I said. Now it was my turn to take offence. "'Are you going to tell me this ghost story?' I asked, flattening down my dress and getting myself comfortable. "'You've rather wet my appetite now, and I should be disappointed if I don't hear some dreadful story as a result of this.' He considered a moment, and looked off into some far-off distance that I could not see. I watched him in silence, biding my time and hoping his wish to talk and convey the story would win out in the end. I was not wrong. "'When I was a young man,' I had very little. I wasn't what you'd call a gentleman, you see. I was bright enough and a hard worker, always had been. 
When I first grew into a man, I was determined to rise above my station and to make something of myself. A very noble pursuit, you'll not disagree. I did not. Well, a young man without means is in need of some subsidy, work. I needed a paying position, and where should I find this but in an office near the docks, not too far from where I was born. Docks themselves were all but disused, as most of the cargo that had frequented the place was borne into the city, up and down the country, by other means now. The hours were demanding, but uh, I was determined, and I threw myself into my work, with the diligence that makes me wipe my brow in memory of it, he said, retrieving a handkerchief from his pocket and doing just that at the appropriate place. There was a young man I worked with there, young, hot-blooded thing. He was not quite my overseer, but rather the equal of my overseer in the workplace. His name was Thomas, that being his last name. I never liked him much. From what I heard, he was, overall, not like that much at all by anyone in the office. He could, it's true, be nice and courteous when the humour took him, and he was known by all as a very clever man, but there were too many occasions I can recall when he was rude and arrogant, shouting at both his subordinates and his equals for no real founded reason. I think he must have been from a good family, you know. Some people who have had money all their lives, and due to their own bad handling of it, they need to send the young men of the family out to work, and he resented that. He made it known. Everyone knew that while he was good at his job, he would rather be anywhere other than working. Spending the money already frittered away through the years, I shouldn't wonder, as he'd been used to doing, but now he was having to muck in with us, this Thomas. He was a good-looking lad, mind you. Much as I was glad not to have a temper such as he, I'd have given a good something to cut as fine a picture as he did. The old man drifted for a moment, his memories obviously overtaking him. I waited patiently, as I knew our end journey was still a little way off, and even if it took us an hour or more to alight at the other side, the story would be done for then, surely. I had a supervisor, however, who thought the same as me, and didn't care all that much for Thomas, but who I greatly respected. He seemed a good man. "'good with people, even-tempered, "'always had time for those who had questions "'or who wanted to get on. "'So when, as I had only a little to do with it, "'but knew a thing or two, "'I thought that there was money going missing from the company. "'It was to E I went. "'I sat up a little. "'While I hadn't heard anything about ghosts yet, "'I was still rather naturally interested in his story. "'I went to him, Barnes his name, "'and he told me that I was right, "'as far as he knew.' "'that a hundred pounds had somehow gone missing. "'I told him plain that if he suspected me, "'why should I bring it to his attention, "'and that I had a rather good idea who it was that had taken it. "'He replied to me, "'I think we all do, don't you?' "'And though he did not know of what I spoke, "'we both looked over to Thomas, "'who was in a bad temper already. "'We could not tell whether he had heard us or not. "'Supervisor Barnes told me to leave it with him, "'and he would look into it, "'make sure that there really was some money missing, "'and it hadn't been an oversight on either of our parts. "'And then, when he had any evidence or further ideas, "'he would fetch me for what we had spoken of. "'I don't know how far he got, because he died that night.' "'This part was quite abrupt and caused me to lean forward instinctively. "'Died?' I repeated. "'Not natural,' he assured me quickly. "'Oh, no, nothing natural about it. "'They found him floating in the docks the next day.' said he must have slipped and fallen on his way home from the office that evening. But, because he and I knew each other well enough, I knew that where he had ended up was nowhere near his route home. He had no need to go to the docks. So why'd he ended up drowned in them? I nodded, waiting for him to go on. Well, I became worried, as anyone would be. A hundred pounds may be a lot of money, but it certainly wasn't worth dying over, and I began to suspect that Barnes had been done to death because he knew, as I did, exactly into whose pocket that hundred pounds had gone. So though I mourned him, I knew the best thing to do, for now at least, was to hold my tongue and keep quiet about what I thought I knew. I would have liked to have carried on and forgotten about the old thing, as much as I'd have been able, except that more money disappeared from the accounts. Now, a hundred pounds, it seems a lot, but it might be an oversight and not so greatly missed. But when five hundred pounds goes missing, then people higher up than me start to take notice. And of course, my equals and I were suspected. Because we were the poorer of the bunch in the office, 
And what could the gentleman amongst us want with more money? Stealing wasn't considered a gentleman's crime, you see. Stealing was the pastime of those who had come from nothing. Those who had common surnames to follow their Christian names, but those on the least pay, of course. But of course it, it wasn't you, I said, now thoroughly involved, as my storyteller was really quite growing on me. You suspected Thomas. Was it him? He held up a hand and smiled as if to calm me down somewhat and indicate that all would be revealed in time. I sat back and waited. We were all interviewed, one by one, for them to try and understand who might have taken the money. When it came to my turn to be asked the questions, you could have knocked me down with a feather, but if it wasn't Thomas himself, in the presence of several of the other supervisors who was doing the questioning. He asked me about the money that had gone, and I said I knew nothing of it. "'But,' says he, "'did you not speak to Mr. Barnes "'about the fact that a hundred pounds "'had gone missing when first it did?' "'I knew then that he knew "'that both Barnes and I had been on to him, "'and I began to be afraid. "'I denied all knowledge of this, "'saying he must be confusing me with another young man, "'as I knew nothing about this former hundred pounds gone missing, "'and I didn't know of Mr. Barnes's involvement. "'It felt wrong to lie.' but I knew that the alternative might be to be found lying face down on the surface of the dock's water one day. I don't know that he believed me, but whether to my dismay or my elation I told my lie very well, and was allowed to return to work straight after. My companion paused in his oration, and took a deep breath at this point, both hands now resting on his cane, as if it might have been a surface. I wished to prod him so I could hear more, but I was able to contain myself and wait for him to begin again. That night, as I was making my way home, by way of the docks, it was getting towards winter time, you see, and the weather was either bad or worse, I began to be afeard. I was eager to get home, nearly ran some of the way, but then a fog rolled in over the dock, and you see, the docks by night, with not much else to navigate yourself by, all parts looked very much the same, and seeing as it was already rather dark, I found myself hopelessly lost, "'stumbling so easily towards the stone walls "'and taking the same wrong turn more than once. "'I didn't know what to do, "'save to keep trying and press on, "'as I dared not go back to the office either "'in case Thomas had discovered my deception "'and decided to have me meet a similar end to Barnes. "'To my dismay, "'I came to a turning point "'that I could have sworn I had already gone down "'once if not twice already. I "'Began to fear I would be down here all night "'when suddenly I heard. "'He paused and breathed in. "'seeming a little shaken. "'I heard something like footsteps, "'light and quick and assured footsteps, "'close in front of me. "'I stood stock still, all afraid. "'They seemed to lead away from me. "'Unable to see, I simply stood where I was. "'Then I heard them again, "'as if starting from exactly the same spot "'where they had sounded before.' Well, that made no sense, I thought. A man could not walk away, then materialise himself back where he had been only a moment before. Growing a little bolder, I called out, Hello? As I'm sure you already know, I got no answer. Instead, after a moment, I heard the exact same thing as I'd heard before, a footstep starting in a spot a mere few paces from me, and moving away through the fog. As much as my heart was in my mouth, I decided to follow them, see if I could find this man, if it was a man, in the darkness, and I listened to the footsteps and followed him. Then, as they had not done before, they continued through the fog, always a few steps in front of me. Before a minute had passed, the footsteps paused for a moment, and in what little light there was by the dock, I saw that I stood by a large seaman's rope tied to a mooring. "'There was no ship or boat tied to it, and it seemed to be out of use, "'for, of course, the docks were very seldom used by now. "'Why the footsteps stopped there, I don't know, "'but I felt a shudder creep upon me, "'for I was sure that, from what I had heard, "'this must be the place where Barnes had been found the morning after his drowning. "'I didn't care to stay there, "'but again there was no way for me to know which way I might be going to get away properly.' thought I heard the wind say, Rope! It said again, a little louder than before. I looked at the rope. I had no idea what significance the rope might have, but 
I was sure I had heard that very word. Rope. I cannot make you understand what I did next. I only knew that some force that I cannot truly explain wanted that rope to be used for something. As I went towards it and picked the thing up, there seemed to be a great sighing in the wind, but no other word. Though it was still attached to its mooring, I reeled some of the rope in and lay it on the path, not quite as well managed as I should have wanted, as there was much of it, to be sure, and I had half a time reeling it in. But as soon as I had finished and most of the rope lay on the path, all in something of a wet, tangled heap, I heard those strange footsteps once again, in front of me. And eager not to let them slip away, I ran on behind them, leaving the rope. I'm sure I need not tell you that before too long I found myself at the edge of the dockland, quite safe, and the fog only behind me. I thought, at one point as I walked away, that I heard what seemed to be a distant cry, like that of a man shouting for help, but it was only for a moment. And I was sure that, after most of the night's doings, they were all the work of a very nervous mind. I had, after all, been several times frightened for my very life. He heaved another deep sigh. He turned to me and saw, to what appeared to be his satisfaction, that I was completely wrapped up in what he was saying. But you saw nothing that night, I confirmed with him. Nothing that would have told you that without a shadow of a doubt what happened to you was an experience with a ghost. Again he held up his hand. I'm almost at the end of my tale. I didn't interrupt him again, and nodded with a smile, waiting for him to continue. I got to work late that next morning, but I wasn't admonished for it at all. I got into the office and found that several of the supervisors were trying to delegate work and sort things out, but seemed in something of a kerfuffle. Several of them did not look so well, and when I asked one of my equals, a good, decent fellow by the name of Goodall, what the matter with them was, he answered, "'Haven't you heard? Another of the supervisors has been drowned, in the docks last night. That young Thomas chap, you know him.' My face might have turned white. "'Drowned?' I repeated. "'Him too. What on earth happened?' Some damn fool of a sailor left his rope out on the path last night. Thomas stayed behind late, Lord alone knows why. He had some work to do. He left not long after you, as it happens. Well, as he's making his way along the dock path, he trips over and gets his feet all tangled up in the rope and falls into the dock. Terrible thing. He didn't drown at first, you see, not from the look on him when they found him early in the morning. But instead he was there, all tangled up and lying against the wall, getting himself more and more tangled in the rope— and then the water started to rise with the tide. I did not need to hear any more from him. I don't know that I cared to think too deeply about what had really happened that night, but I have, from that day to this, been able to content myself with the thought that there was no way I could have known what was to become of Thomas. And also, that if his business had been with me that night, as I suspect, and he had been following me, and so much the better that it be he that met his end in that terrible manner. Same as Barnes. At this the old man exhaled one last time, his grin gone, but a tremendous look of relief on his face. I sat where I was, quite still, waiting for him in case there be more. There was none, it seemed. You think, I heard myself saying, though I tried my best not to lend it too much credence, you think that you were being helped home that night? Helped? he repeated. "'Saved, say rather. "'For if it was me that Thomas was after, "'and I was there lost on the docks in that fog. "'After all, who else could have known "'what Thomas was capable of? "'How can you explain anything that happened that night? "'I didn't know where to begin. "'I wondered for a moment if I should tell him "'a little something about human minds under stress, "'or how the fog itself can play tricks on eyes "'and sense of hearing,' or how the wind sounds when rushing around walled places, bouncing off water, or even the power of coincidence, and possibly a feeling of guilt that he had not yet come to terms with. But I had not the time. As I was still considering what I should say or do, I felt the carriage come to a stop, and after a moment's pause, the door on my side was opened wide, and Lucas, my fiancé, his smile wide and expectant, extended a hand to help me alight. I was so pleased to see him— 
for I had in truth not seen him for the better part of a month by this point, that I quite forgot my companion for a moment, and happily jumped down from the carriage, embracing him in greeting. The driver of the carriage started to remove my baggage from the top. "'You're a brave, extravagant little thing, aren't you?' Lucas asked whimsically as was his way. "'Coming across the way all by yourself?' "'Not quite,' I informed him. "'I had a very good companion who told me a marvellous little ghost story as it happens.' I suddenly realised that I hadn't even caught the gentleman's name, or told him mine, and if we were to ever meet in a carriage again, coming and going from wherever it was we might be going, it would be decidedly awkward, if not seemingly rude of me, and I threw back open the door of the carriage to have some parting words with my travelling escort. But the carriage now was empty, and my friend, along with his cane and sharp suit, was gone. The driver came to ask me for my money, and I took out my purse. "'Strange chap, that gentleman,' I said to him. "'Tells a good ghost story, though, I must say.' The driver looked confused for a moment, then recognition rippled across his face. "'Oh, yes, <laughs> he loves his yarn, does Mr. Joseph. Tells it to anyone who'll give him time, he will.' "'Mr. Joseph,' I repeated. "'Is that his name?' "'It was,' the driver replied. He could tell from my face that I didn't follow. With some hesitation, but a great deal of resignation as well, he continued. "'Can't get him out of my carriage for love nor money, miss. So eager is he to tell his ghost story.' Always was. Mr. Joseph's been dead seven years, miss, 